So bloody hot. Bring on Fimblevinter. Hey, thanks for joining. We here at Queer Amalgams are proud Loki stands. Yeah, yeah, Hiddleston's alright. I haven't watched the TV series yet, but I hear good things. Better. Love a good hero turned sassy anti-hero. I don't really buy physical comics. But when I do, guess who's on the cover? No, we're talking OG Loki. Lopped. Brother of Bilster. Gender fluid god of tricks and change. And it seems to me he often gets a bad rap. Generally being relegated to the Satan type of the Norse pantheon. Fact is, more often than not, stories find him at the side of this family causing trouble, but inevitably helping out and making the gods' lives better for his interference. Maybe you're still sceptical, so let me tell you a selection of stories and you can make your own mind up. He's known by many to be part Jotun, that much is undeniable. His mother Laufey had him by the Jotun and Farbalsi. However, people will point to these genetics as being a sign of his inherent badness. You know who else is part giant? Odin, who was born to the Jotun Bestler. By extension, most of the Ysir greats have giant's blood running through their veins. Fact is, as attested in Gilfaginning, Loki is firmly one of the Ysir, and for all his reputation as a mischief monger, his tales must always find him helping them, despite their ingratitude. In the early days, three Aesir, Loki, Odin and Hoenir, were wandering abroad in order to better know the world. Their trip took them one day to Edvara Falls, where the trio stopped to fish. While they rested, Loki spied an otter nearby as it caught a salmon. When the otter closed its eyes to eat, Loki threw a rock, striking its head and killing it. Loki bragged to his companions that he had caught both salmon and otter with a single stone. The gods agreed this was rather impressive, and they skinned the beast to make a bag. That night, their travels led them to the home of mighty Hraidmar. The Aesir requested lodging, reassuring the man that they had enough food of their own by showing their provisions and game. This included their recently acquired otter pelt, the sight of which roused Hraidmar to fury. He called in his sons, informing them that their brother Otter had been murdered. And here were the blackguards who did the deed. They seized and bound the gods, who quickly offered as much gold as Hraidmar asked for in compensation. Hraidmar agreed, and they made their oaths their lives for enough gold to fill and cover the otter pelt bag. Swift Loki was chosen to find the gold, and released. His first stop was to the sea goddess Raun, from whom he borrowed a fishing net. Returning to Anvara Falls, he looked for the dwarf Anvari, for he knew that, similar to Otter, Anvari would shapeshift into a pike to fish. With Raun's net, Loki caught the pike, and offered him his life for the small ransom of all his gold. While the dwarf was bringing his treasures forth, Loki also spied Anvarin out, a small gold ring that had blessed Anvari with his wealth. Loki demanded that it be included in the ransom, though Anvari protested. Without it, he would be unable to regain his riches. But eventually, though reluctantly, he acquiesced. The ransom was collected and thus released. The dwarf cast some small revenge. He uttered a grim curse on the gold. Now that the gold the gust once had, bring their death to brothers twain. And evil be for heroes eight, Joy of my wealth shall no man win. Loki returned to Hraidmar with the gold, and they covered the otter skin. A single hair remained, which Odin covered with the magic ring. With the exchange made, Loki informed Hraidmar of the curse lain on the gold. Hraidmar declared that he wouldn't have taken the ransom had he known, but convinced himself that the curse would not pass during his generation. The gold so red shall I rule, methinks. For long as I shall live, not of fear for thy threats I feel. So get ye hence to your homes. So it was that Loki helped free Odin and Hunir, without whom we would not exist. When Midgard and Valhalla were newly built, a rite approached the gods and offered to build them a great citadel. In return, he asked to be repaid with the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya. The Asir convened and decided they would accept the deal, on the condition that the rite finish in a single winter. Come the first day of summer, if he were unfinished, he would not be paid. In addition, he was to work alone. The right counter offered that he might at least have the aid of his stallion, Svadofari. This is when Loki piped up, and seeing the sure bet that the rest of the gods had set up, he advised they take the deal. The right thusly got to work, setting stones by day and hauling up more by night with the help of his horse. He did impressive work, the horse even more so. Eventually, they had three days left on the clock, and it seemed the Asir might have to make good on their bargain. 
They met to bandy about blame, seemingly forgetting that it was the lot of them who agreed to the deal. Loki, who had just suggested the bloke might be allowed to use his horse, was afforded the entirety of the blame. He had clearly tricked them, you see, and if he didn't find a way out, he would be killed. Fearful for his life, Loki swore that he would find a way to get them out of the deal, at any cost. That night, the right and the stallion went out to collect more stone, when a mare jumped out before them. Clearly, it had been a while for Svaldofari, who immediately became frantic, broke his bonds, and chased after the mare as she fled into the woods. Without his horse, the right's work output plummeted, and seeing that he would be unable to finish in time, he flew into a giant's rage. Indeed, the right had been a hill giant the entire time. This being revealed to the gods, they opted to renege on their deal anyway, instead summoning the violent Thor, who had been away fighting trolls. On sight, Thor raised Mjolnir and shattered the giant's skull. Loki, for it was he who had lured Svaldofari away in the guise of a mare, had such dealings with the stallion that he later gave birth to a grey, eight-legged foal. This foal grew into the greatest horse of all gods and men, Sleipnir, Odin's own steed. Mjolnir made a brief appearance in that one, you know Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. Infamous among the Jotnar, possibly one of the most well-known objects in Norse lore. Well, it was Loki's fault that it even got made in the first place. One day, Loki, on a lark, cut off the hair of Sif, Thor's wife. Thor was upset and violently threatened Loki. Loki, enjoying the continued integrity of his bones, promised to make amends. He headed to Svartalfheim, home of the dwarves, where he commissioned three objects from the sons of Vivaldi. As well as golden hair, which would grow as soon as it was placed on Sif's head, these master craftsfolk made the great ship Skifblathnir, whose sails would fill with fair wind as soon as they were hoisted, and the spear Gungnir, that once thrown would never miss its mark. Already going above and beyond, Loki decided to see if he couldn't get a little more out of the dwarves. Wagering his own head, he approached brothers Broker and Atri with a challenge, that they couldn't make three objects at least as good as the sons of Vivaldi. The dwarves accepted the wager. With his brother on the bellows, Adri first laid a boar skin in their furnace, and ordered Broker to keep the heat up until he said otherwise. A fly burst in, who some believed to be Loki in disguise, trying to sway things in his favour, and with his own head on the line, who can blame him? Whatever the case, the fly stung Broker on the hand. Despite this, Broker maintained his grip on the bellows. Adri returned, and from the furnace pulled a boar with bristles of gold that could run in air and water better than any horse. Next, Atri placed gold in the furnace, and again, the fly stung Broker, now on the neck. Still, the dwarf remained resolute, allowing his brother to successfully create Dropner, a golden ring that would produce eight more golden rings every ninth night. Finally, Atri placed iron in the furnace, and left, reminding his brother to keep blowing those bellows. This time, the fly landed on his face and stung his eyelids. Blood dripped down Broker's eyes, briefly blinding him, such that for a second, he let go of the bellows to wave the fly away. Atri returned and pulled from the flames a hammer claiming it near entirely ruined. Broker and Loki returned to the Asir, where Odin, Thor and Freya would settle the wager. To Odin, Loki gave Gungnir, to Freya, Skithblathnir, and to Thor, Sith's new golden hair. Broker then presented his treasures, giving Dropner to Odin, the boar to Freya, and to Thor, he gave the almost ruined hammer, named Mjolnir. This hammer, he claimed, could not be damaged. Thor was struck with it as hard as he liked. It could be thrown far, but never so far that it would not return to his hand if desired, and it was small enough that it might be concealed. It was, however, flawed, in that its handle was perhaps a little shorter than intended. The gods discussed and made their decision. The hammer was the greatest of the treasures presented, and surely a great defence against Jotun invasion. This did, of course, mean that Loki had lost his wager. He tried to ransom his head, but the dwarf was having none of it. Loki attempted to flee, but Thor, despite being handed the gods' best weapon against the giants, sided against his own family and seized Loki. Loki's last gambit was to point out that he wages his head, not his neck. So the frustrated dwarf instead sewed the trickster's lips together. There came a day when Thor woke up to find his beloved Mjolnir missing. Who did he call him first to help but Loki? Despite Thor's beastly behaviour before, Loki agrees and goes to Freya to borrow her flying cloak. Donning the cloak, Loki flew to Thrymir in Jotunheim, who proudly boasted that it was he who had stolen the hammer. He would return it, however, if Freya were to marry him. Loki flew back to Thor to explain the situation, and together they returned to Freya, who was decidedly reluctant to comply. Fair enough, but still the situation was dire, and the gods gathered to discuss it. Heimdall offered an idea that they tricked the giant by having Thor dress as Freya instead, just long enough to retrieve the hammer. 
Thor was angrily opposed. Apparently dressing up as a woman was more objectionable than literally giving one away like property. It was Loki who persuaded him, reminding him that without Mjolnir, Asgard was without protection from Jotun invasion. With that, the plan was settled. Thor shall go to Jotunheim as Thrymmer's bride-to-be, and Loki shall attend as bridesmaid. So disguised, the pair arrived in Jotunheim. Thrymmer displayed for them all his riches, stating that Freya was all that was missing from his treasures. That evening came a feast in honour of the bride. Not being renowned for his acting, Thor inadvertently dropped his disguise somewhat, devouring meat and mead in a manner most on Freya. Thrymmer noted as much, but the ruse was maintained by quick-thinking Loki, who explained that Freya, so excited, had not eaten in eight days. Thrymmer then moved to lift Freya's veil to see the face of this beautiful bride, but instead found horrifying eyes burning like fire staring back. Loki again managed to explain this away, saying that Freya was so excited, neither had she slept in eight days. At this point, Freya was asked for a bridal gift. In return, the Jotnar brought out Mjolnir, and possibly for the first time in this whole ordeal, Thor smiled. He seized his hammer and proceeded to kill everyone, presumably still in his wedding dress. Alright, this is the big one. The main strike against Loki. The story goes thus. Baldur was the greatest and noblest of gods, beloved by all. It happened that he and his mother Frigg had been sharing nightmares, prophetic dreams of his death. Odin rode down to Niflhel to seek a dead seer and ask her what this could mean, and received the answer that it was fairly straightforward. It meant Baldur was fated to die. So Frigg went across the world, drawing vows from all objects never to hurt her son, and oaths were made by all, except mistletoe, knowledge of which made its way to Loki. Having become nigh invulnerable, the god's game du jour became throwing all sorts of objects at Baldur, all of which bounced off harmlessly. Loki found his way to one of these games, and having fashioned a spear from mistletoe, gave it to Baldur's brother, blind Hodor. Hodor chucked the spear, and sure enough, it pierced Baldur, killing him. Long story short, Frigg begs Hel to release her son, and Hel agrees, on the condition that Frigg get every object alive and dead to weep for him. With all a mother's determination to save her children, Frigg goes round getting those tears a-flowing. And everyone does, except a giantess Thok, often thought to be Loki in disguise. So it was that Baldur was to remain in the underworld, not to be freed until Ragnarok to rule Earth with Thor's sons. So, that's bad. Loki gets Baldur killed, then possibly prevents his resurrection. But hang on, pay attention to the end there. You see, Ragnarok is the big showdown at the end of the world. But this isn't a final judgement full stop end of the world. Existence is cyclical, and when all settles, the world will be remade, with Baldur and Odin's place as top god. In the stories I've told so far, we can see that for all his mischief, and despite their oft times ungrateful, even cruel treatment of him, Loki always strives to do well by his family. Despite this, we also know he plays a big part in Ragnarok. It's his release from bondage that sets the whole thing off, and ultimately he sides against the Aesir in the fight that follows, his own children responsible for much of the damage. I want to engage in some speculation in order to bridge this apparent face-heel turn. Along with his history of helping his folk out of predicaments, the story of Baldur shows us that Loki has ways of obtaining hidden information. I put it to you that some way, somehow, Loki gleaned some knowledge of the world post-Ragnarok. He saw that the only way the best of the gods would survive would be if he were to die now. He also saw that the only way to kill Baldur, to secure his path into the new world, would mean being seen as the villain. He couldn't confide in his fellow gods. Frigg's absurd quest for the absolute protection of her son showed him that they were quite content to grimly cling to the status quo while the waves of fate ever crashed against them. But there is no stopping Ragnarok, and it would take the machinations of a god of change and chaos to save his family in some small way even if that meant becoming utterly reviled by them. There's one more story I want to tell in its own video, of how Loki came to cause the gods to utterly despise him. So subscribe if that piques your interest, and I'll catch you next time with the poem Locusena.